The Cigar Thoughts Positional Breakdown Series rolls on as we dive into the quarterback scene in Seattle and around the league with ESPN's Mina Kimes. The brilliant analyst and co-host of NFL Live helps assess the QB landscape as well as Geno Smith's place in it. Let's light them up. I'm Jackson Bevins, and this is Cigar Thoughts. Welcome back to the Cigar Lounge. I am Jackson Bevins, and along with my wonderful producer, Mike Barwin, this is the Cigar Thoughts Podcast. Mike, how are we doing today? Doing all right, Jackson. Uh, coming off of a nice little high ankle sprain from playing hoops last <laughs> night, but don't worry. Don't worry, I should be ready in time for training camp. I know that that you was had your OTA your mind injury. Went. That's right. That's right. But I hear the nickel corner job is up for grabs, and I intend to stake my claim. So I'll be there. <laughs> All right, I'll be there. Man. Don't worry. Good on you. And I'm stoked for today, man. You know, I love doing these positional breakdowns, and we've been really blessed to connect with some amazing people to help us do that. Last week, we had arguably the greatest offensive lineman of all time in Walter Jones to examine Seattle's O-line. And today we get one of the sharpest minds covering the game to look at quarterback with us. But before we do that, I want to remind everyone listening that Father's Day is coming up. And if you still haven't gotten dad the perfect gift, we've got you covered. As many of you know and have found out for yourselves, the official Cigar Thoughts cigars are now available for purchase at CigarThoughtsNFL.com. And as I mentioned last week with quick shipping, yes, they can still arrive in time for Pop's Big Day. Direct links to order them will be in the notes on the show page as well. So feel free to click that from whichever platform you're listening on. And, you know, we we posted this on our Instagram stories yesterday. But one of the guys who ordered them uh, is a guy named Ira. And, and I've actually met him and hung out with him a few times. He's an awesome dude. Uh, but he puts together his own bourbon blends. And he liked the cigar so much that he actually put together a Cigar Thoughts bourbon. Uh, so I got a chance to try that out yesterday. It was amazing. But as, as those of you who have already ordered know... These cigars are made from a blend of premier Dominican tobacco leaf. It's been aged 13 years. They're available to Cigar Thoughts listeners for less than half of their normal MSRP. If you haven't gotten any yet, do it for yourself. Do it for dad. Do it to help support the show. Like I said, delivery speedy. Feedback's been incredible. We've had multiple people tell us they're among the most enjoyable cigars they've ever had. So if you're looking to level up your Stogie experience, you're not going to find a better way to do that than with these right here. We've also launched our YouTube channel where you can catch entire episodes as well as video clips from every show. This is one of the best ways you can support Cigar Thoughts, so we're grateful for the few seconds it'll take for you to subscribe. Now, Mike, how lucky are we, man? Very. Always. Very. Not one week after the GOAT left tackle blessed the pod, we're joined by one of the true stars covering the National Football League. If you've been unconscious for the better part of the last decade, our guest today is the co-host of NFL Live and a regular on ESPN's hit shows Around the Horn and Highly Questionable. She is also the co-host of the Mina Kimes show featuring Lenny and a friend of our show dating back to the very beginning. For everyone who has been sentient during that time, however, she needs no introduction. She is Mina Kimes and she's here to talk QB with us. Mina, thank you for coming in. Hi, I'm so excited to talk about Gino and some of the other quarterbacks in particular. It's going to be fun. Yeah, yeah. Excited to have you. And, you know, there's no conversation surrounding the NFL that gets people going quite like quarterback. And that makes sense because it's the most important position in football. Besides running backs, of course. <laughs> Yeah, Actually, besides, of course, besides running mind. back, yeah. <laughs> Mina, for, for decades, honestly, we've seen general NFL quarterback play get better year over year. And that kind of seemed to culminate in the first half of 2020 when the NFL was on pace to obliterate all the league wide scoring and yardage numbers. But then and, and this seemed to happen almost instantly. That momentum halted. And I think it's largely due to the near universal implementation of two high safety shell defenses. Teams are still gaining more yards and scoring more points than they did 10 years ago, but statistically, QB play has sort of leveled off and it's honestly dipped from that roaring 2020. So when you look at the sports constant evolution, do you see offenses pushing through this current ceiling? I do. I think, you know, we, we've obviously had some legends retire, age out. Tom Brady is no longer an NFL mm -hmm. quarterback, obviously being one. You know, Drew Brees that's, retired. That's crazy thought. Not too long ago. Aaron Rodgers is contemplating retirement, although he's still playing. And I think he will be playing at a high level. Um, but, you know, we're looking at a bit of a changing of the guard at the moment. Um, top quarterbacks 
right now, a lot of them are really young and uh, mm -hmm. several of them are from the same draft class. I think the last few draft classes kind of waiting for the cream to rise outside of, you know, Trevor Lawrence being an obvious name that I think we're all pretty high on. Um, but, you know, I, I, to me, production, as you kind of alluded to, waxes and wanes a little bit in response to offensive and defensive trends. Um, and I do think, you know, over the last couple of years, defenses pushed back a little bit schematically on some of the things we saw the previous four to five years, especially with the advent of the Sean McVay, Kyle Shanahan offense in the NFL and what that does for quarterbacks. But I'm pretty excited, sure. you know, just working on uh, kind of listing them, ranking them. Um, I've talked about them over, over the last few weeks on my podcast. There's a lot of really good names, especially in the top 10. I think it's after the top 10 where things get a little bit hairy. Yeah, yeah, you know, because I think if you could, you know, play Madden and turn off the injury settings, this list gets a little bit different, right? But yeah. You, you have to factor in some some risk assessment. And I, and I think the way that we see NFL offenses and specifically passing offenses kind of push forward, you know, what we've seen is a lot of underneath stuff. And so a lot of the receivers that I think we're seeing excel are the ones, you know, Debo Samuel had the huge year. Cooper Cup had one of the great seasons of all time. We're obviously seeing what Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddell and some of these guys are doing. It's not a lot of catching 50-yard bombs anymore. These long plays, A.J. Brown is excellent at this. He's taking the short passes. And with those safeties being further off the line of scrimmage, there is a little bit more room, if you beat the man covering you, to catch that ball and get upfield, make a move. Is there anything about that that you think is going to start bringing safeties in a little bit closer to the box? Well, I think, you know, the way some of the best offenses in the NFL have responded to those trends, in addition to kind of leaning more on, you know, the quick underneath passing game, the middle of the field is quarterback mobility that combined with, um, a, you know, a robust option game. Uh, you talked about Jalen Hurts and, and the Eagles offense and then pushing the ball down the field. But uh, part of the reason, you know, they had so many of those tasty looks on the sidelines, those go balls was because defenses were afraid of what they were doing in the run game. So you'd have to yeah. drop an extra safety into the box. And when I look at, uh, my top 10 or even the guys drafted this year, none of whom I have yet in my top 10, of course, um, mobility is, seems to reign supreme right now. It, it matters yeah. so much more than it did when Russell Wilson came into the NFL, RG3, Colin Kaepernick. That was sort of the beginning of, oh, the read option. And, and this isn't just a college thing. And it's not just a one-off with a few unicorns like Cam Newton. This is the NFL is changing things kind of stagnated for a while, but I think right now um, that it, it's so important for quarterbacks to have that. And even quarterbacks who we don't think of as being mobile guys like Joe Burrow or Geno Smith, they can scramble. Yeah. They're not statues and that matters a great deal. Yeah, I, I think so. You know, I, I remember this has got to go back maybe a couple of years on the group chat, but we were, we were talking about the whole running back debate and you made a point that really stuck with me talking about how the NFL is cyclical. It does evolve. And I do think there was a time where the running game got less important to the success of an offense, to the success of a team. I think it's coming back. And I think it has to do with how teams are, are playing these shell coverages. And the surest way to suck safeties back up into the box is to have an effective run game. You know, it's it's really hard if you're giving up five, six yards of carry and your defense can't get off the field to keep those safeties 15, 20 yards off the line of scrimmage. And, and I wonder, as we see, you know, obviously the Eagles have been running the ball extremely well. Uh, we've seen the Ravens do it, the 49ers. Some of the top teams, the Cowboys, have had really effective run games. I'm wondering if we don't start to see the deep parts of the field start to open up for uh, some of these big arm quarterbacks. Yeah. I, I think that's something teams like Baltimore now with some of the evolution they're undergoing on offense, both adding, you know, a bunch of wide receivers and changing coordinator. Um, they're hoping to capitalize on some of the, you know, the way defenses play them. It really helps by the way, when quarterbacks come into the league um, because they just get simpler looks and, more one-on-one -on -one opportunities. Um, Seattle's a really good 
case study for this because uh, as good as the offense last year was, the rushing attack was not very efficient. They were much better throwing yep. the ball than running it for a litany of reasons. And I think if the run game can be better and more effect- effective this year, and that's what I think of when I talk about balance. It's not I don't think of X number of carries or whatever. I think you, you yep. want to be able to run the ball efficiently, not just explosives, but on a down-to-down basis. I think that'll open up more opportunities for Geno Smith and this incredible wide receiver core. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with that as far as it pertains to Seattle because they they were kind of that home runner strikeout type of hitter with especially with, yeah. with Ken Walker. I, I think Rashad Penny was really starting to round into mm-hmm. that more complete back because he's always had the home run speed but he was being really effective running the football before his latest injury and then you saw ken walker obviously get off to that amazing start to his career once he took that rollover but we also saw the interior of the offensive line regress and and you know one of the things that walter jones pointed out last week is just it's a young line these guys are playing more snaps against tougher players than they've ever done before it's just a thing that happens with most offensive lines they they kind of wear down and and Seattle didn't really have a counterpunch for that in in the run game but you know we're we're seeing defensive ends are arguably the best athletes on the field now uh between size and just pure explosiveness and all that kind of thing and and that mobility that you mentioned I think is becoming even more as a premium and and as I look at these lists you know I I'm really eager to dive into Geno Smith with you, but I think in order to do that the most effective way, it's helpful to provide some context on just where he stands. You know, it's easy to say so-and-so is a top whatever quarterback, but oftentimes those declarations are made in a vacuum. So Mm -hmm. we're going to talk a little bit about the QB landscape where each of us have ranked some of these guys. And as you mentioned earlier, you recently ranked your QBs on your show and I put my list together as well. And I think we approached it from a similar standpoint. I framed it as what order would I draft these guys if they were all going to sign identical two-year deals for the same exact amount of money. What was your framework? Yeah, I did three years. Um, okay. But yeah, I I, I, tr- I really tried to look at it in a vacuum as well, right? Which is not, these are the 10 quarterbacks I think are going to have the best seasons because I, context matters right. so much for the quarterback position. And I, you know, disregarded contracts too, Um it, which is hard to do. I mean, if, you know, when you're parsing out stats, for example, again, it's so context dependent. It's why yes. the Niners quarterbacks always have like unbelievable stats, right? But we know how inflated those are by their circumstances. Yeah. Didn't Jimmy Garoppolo lead the league in yards per So attempt? many. He has, <laughs> like, his stats with are... like the lowest average depth of target. Yes, absolutely <laughs> ridiculous. So, you know, they matter. Some I, I do think stats matter but you, for quarterback play, obviously, but you have to kind of put them in context. So I, I did my best to um, separate them from that. I will say I, I went back to my list and I changed it a little bit because you have a two-year timeline. Okay. I had Kyler Murray higher in my list accounting – for his injury, though, uh, on a two-year mm-hmm. timeline, I would obviously be a lot more reluctant to take him just because we don't know when he's going to even play this season. That's right. Yeah, that, that's fair. So uh, I'm, I'm going off of uh, the original list that, that you sent me, so feel free to make any that's the one um, I'm gonna adjustments. Kinda... Yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. I'll be interested to see where he ends up because initially I have him a bit lower than where, than where you did. So I'm going to run through your list real quick, then mine. And we don't need to talk about all 20. We each picked our top 20. But I do want to highlight some of the discrepancies that we have. We can talk about them sure. and then, of course, get to Gino. So just holler uh, when I get to Kyler. Let me know where you switched him to. Move him to the end, basically. So the end of okay. my 20. Okay. All right. You, you go. Your top five is Mahomes, Josh Allen, Joe Burrow, Justin Herbert, Lamar Jackson. And then after that, you've got Jalen Hurts, Trevor Lawrence, Dak Prescott, Aaron Rodgers and Geno Smith at 10. Do you see like a clear tear break somewhere in that top 10? Uh, yeah, I, I think there's a pretty strong. So this is where timeline really matters with Lamar Jackson. I moved him up for you uh, from my rankings a little bit because of the recent injury history. You know, he's not finishing seasons. Yeah. That really does matter. Um, I felt like the top four, it seems like most people, I, I've found in conversations a lot of people feel the same way. Although I guess J- Jackson and Hertz, you could put in that group too. So I would say that the top six feels pretty 
pretty set in stone. Yeah. Yep. I'm, I'm with you there. Uh, your next 10 go Tua, and then you did have Kyler, but we're going to move him down. Then Cousins, Derek Carr, Justin Fields, Deshaun Watson, Ryan Tannehill, Matt Stafford, and Jared Goff. And then sounds like Kyler somewhere yeah. down at the end of that. I, I, I shrugged when he said Watson. Who the hell knows? But <laughs> I know. I, he's he's the toughest one for me Stafford, you to could rank argue because who the hell knows what's going to Totally. Happen. And and for me, a big part of it is, you know, is something we've talked about on this show plenty of times is in a quarterback, I'm not just looking for what you do on Sunday. Like you're the face of my franchise. This franchise is worth $5 billion. You're the de facto CEO. You're the one answering all the questions. You're the one where if you fuck up, it matters. The whole team has to answer questions about that. So that factored in as well. And that makes Deshaun really Knock tough to rank because free. yeah. Yeah. So I've got Mahomes one. I've got Jalen Hurts two. Ooh. Joe Burrow three. Josh Allen four. Justin Herbert. Then Lamar Jackson, Trevor Lawrence, Dak Prescott, Aaron Rodgers, Geno Smith, also at 10. And then Tua at 11. Then I go Deshaun, Cousins, Kyler, Fields, Stafford, Anthony Richardson, Derek Carr, and Jared Goff. You love Richardson. So, two years, though? Would you take him for the first two years? I think dude? so. You're, I, 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 I think choice. so. We'll, we'll get to it. We'll, we'll touch on that. We'll touch on that. I know that I that's, like too, that's, like the ultimate, yeah. <laughs> that's like the ultimate wild card. So uh, the big discrepancy at the top, you know, a lot of people have the same top three, top five, top six, but we've got a pretty big difference between Jalen Hurts and Josh yeah. Allen. What led you to put Josh Allen at number two, which is where I would have had him going into last year. Yeah, I, I think for me with Hurts, it was kind of a sample size issue. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, we're looking at one year of elite play. And even uh, he's one where I thought, oh, my God, his circumstances were so incredible. You know, mm -hmm. I, I just did the top. NFL offenses on my podcast, trying to project the top 10 offenses. Uh, yeah, I saw that. I, I had the Seahawks at six, which is pretty high. Um, uh -huh. But I had the Eagles at two just because I was just like, my God. Like, they have the best offensive line. They have one of the best wide receiver cores. They have one of the best tight ends. I think the run game will be really good. Like, it's just incredible. Now, Jalen Hurts yeah. makes a lot of that sing, especially, again, just yeah. how much he's developed as a passer. But I just kind of felt like, if I was to take these guys, take them out of their teams and just mm -hmm. try to win a game, I've seen Josh Allen do, you know, a little bit more with less and do it over a longer period of time at this point. Yeah. Yeah. And I, my guess is most people are going to have Allen higher on their list than Hurts. The reason I went uh, Jalen so high is one, I just think he's like the ultimate ace as far as just the guy leading your team, you know, first one in last one out says all the right stuff is, is the consummate professional. But I think that there is a massive, massive X factor, uh, that he has, um, when he's on the field and I think Josh Allen has it too. That UCL injury worries me. Yeah. It really, it really does. His play style concerns me also, you know, I think a lot of the same concerns we have with Lamar Jackson are really in play for for Josh Allen because he has taken those injuries. We haven't really seen that from Jalen Hurts yet. Um, and you're right. Jalen Hurts is in an amazing situation. So is Josh Allen, though. I mean, they're they're both in tremendous offensive ecosystems. Um, you know, there's, there's seven or eight potentially really awesome offenses in the NFL yeah. this year, and I think Seattle could be one of them. I agree. There's only two that feel inevitable when they're on the field, and that's Kansas City and Philadelphia. And I just don't think that would be the case in Philadelphia yeah. if Jalen wasn't the quarterback. Yeah, I had them one and two. Although I, I, I went back and forth because the Bills were better than the Eagles offense last year by most metrics, which is, I think, with the Bills, there's kind of like a bad vibe around them. <laughs> not just because mm -hmm. uh, their wide receiver one, Stephon Diggs, may or may not like want to play there. But <laughs> yeah, um, who knows what's going on there? You know, just after the Josh on UCL injury, there was some up there were a lot of ups and downs and he was not he was trying to play hero ball again. But over the course of the season they actually they were the better offense. Um so I I think we'll learn a lot pretty quickly uh when he takes the yeah. field in terms of seeing if his short area if, if his short accuracy is back on track. But I expect yeah, both of, of them to be amazing. I mean the the top three to me, you know uh, offenses are just all so good. Yeah. Yeah. And it's the middle of June. I mean, this is definitely subject to change. Yeah. You know, it's, I just, 
for me, uh, a big part of it is is also ball protection, not just production. Josh Allen threw more interceptions, mm. more turnovers than anybody in the NFL last year. That that's part part of the puzzle for me. But I got no no issues really with that whole top six. You can almost yeah. put them in any order after Patrick Mahomes that that you want. We're actually fairly in lockstep after yeah. that, uh, including seven, eight, nine, ten, right? And eleven, I think. Oh, yeah. And uh, with Tua and and. The one guy that I want to highlight, obviously, is Chino here. We both have him I knew it. as number 10. I'll, I'll be honest. I'm, I'm not sure he would have been in my top 25 going into last year. Yeah. Uh, but then he was top 10 in just about every metric and top five in some really important ones. How did you end up with Gino ahead of guys like Tua, Kyler, you already kind of mentioned, but Justin Fields, Kirk Cousins, et cetera? Yeah, th- there's a lot of reasons. Obviously, I watched him the closest of any of these quarterbacks. I think you have to start for, with the um, possible criticism or the big question, which is, well, we're leaning on one year, right, with with Geno Smith. And my response to that is it, the, it was not a normal one-year breakout because Geno Smith didn't get a chance for years. So it's not like one of those things. I mean, heck, you could even argue this with Tannehill, that there were injuries in the mix where a guy, you know, came into the right situation, all of a sudden has this big breakout, which does happen in the NFL. That's not what happened with Geno Smith. It wasn't like he was shitty for five years and then suddenly was awesome. He barely right. played. Right. So yeah. I think that matters yeah. a lot when we talk about the the fear of regression um, or, or that he was a one hit wonder. I mean, I, I just think it, it it's there's reason to believe the be- more likely explanation is not that it was luck. And it, the more likely explanation is that he wasn't given a fair shot in the NFL, despite having some pretty cool qualities. Um, so I, I would start there. That's the number one thing I think that matters. Well, and and to your point, it's easy to forget Geno Smith was an extremely highly rated yeah. prospect. And it was a surprise that he was not drafted in the first round. And and I think that centered around some perceived maturity issues that may or may not have played out uh, when he was with the Jets uh, when he first came into the league. But I, I feel like he's just been kind of dogged by that ever since. Yeah, 100 percent. I mean, And that's the thing that you see so much with guys in the NFL like what happens at the beginning of their careers tends to follow them for a while, especially draft status. That's something that's hard to shake. Like if he was yep. taken in the first round, I think he probably would have been given more chances, you know, you know, things like that. And then mm-hmm. there were issues in New York. Um, but obviously he gets the chance in Seattle. And then I guess that co- sort of goes to his play on the field. Um, you know, he's another guy who, I mean, he, he I mentioned this on the pod. he, First in completion percentage over expected. First, meaning the lowest off-target percentage. Uh, He was an incredible deep ball thrower. His numbers in the pocket, which tend to be pretty, in a clean pocket, which tend to be pretty stable, were fantastic. Um, And he did a lot of things that I didn't know he had in his bag, frankly. I knew he was accurate and had a good arm. We've seen that before. But I thought he showed some creative ability, scrambling. He looked really great throwing on the run. Um, And and just a a real command of the offense. Uh, You know, his interceptions, Jackson, I just watched all of his interceptions. Uh, They're not because he was fooled. They happened right. because he was trying to do too much uh, a, a yeah. few times, especially near the end. But that actually I, I in some ways prefer because I really think he's a sophisticated processor um, and just has all of the qualities you need. I mean, he doesn't have elite athleticism like the guys we have at the top. And that'll always, I, you know, I think he's probably never it'd be unlikely for him to be consistently like a top five quarterback, but I I, I totally believe he can stay in the top 10 and sustain the level of play we saw last year. Yeah. I think the thing that stood out to me the most from like a surprising standpoint was the calculated risk factor with Gino, because that that's something that gets left out of the conversation. And it's hard to quantify, you know, Uh, but knowing when to take your shots, you know, not being a Jameis YOLO ball, I'm always going to take the shot and not being, you know, a a late stage Eli Manning never pressed the ball quarterback either. He really picked his spots and, and, and picked them really well. Uh, We're going to talk more Gino here in a bit. I want to go back to our list and talk about a couple other discrepancies that we got. We talk, you know, we both mentioned that, Kyler and Deshaun, it's just, where do you put them? If they're healthy and locked in, they can both be top five, top. They could join that 
that top yeah. tier, but you just, I, I just don't know if I'm the owner of a team to what degree you can count on these guys. And now Kyler, obviously who I like more than most people do, yeah, he's got this injury. Who knows if there's any even reason for him to be on the field this year, that's tough to Sean. Of course, you just, you just don't know. You're, you're a phone call away from that just being over. And it's been a uh, long time <laughs> since we've seen him play good football. I think it's worth. Thinking, it is. Yeah. It's been three years since he's played good football. Yeah, absolutely. He just might not be as good anymore. That yeah, that's within the realm of possibilities as well. Yeah, totally possible. Let's talk about Anthony Richardson. <laughs> Was he even a consideration? For no, you in the top I didn't 20? consider any of the rookies with the two year timeline. I, I kind of vaguely considered them when I expanded out to three and I liked a lot of them in this class. Um, but I just, you know, especially with Richardson where I do think there's going to be a little bit of an adjustment period coming into the NFL, even though he's got like an incredible tool set. Um, I just felt like I couldn't put him above any of the guys who we know are NFL quarterbacks and can, you know, run an NFL offense and do that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, No, I mean, (laughs) you know, how I feel about Anthony Richardson, but (laughs) still in mourning (laughs) or have you moved on to just embracing Gino? You know, uh, he, he ended up in a really good place. I I just didn't want to see him go to some trash organization because I, I think he's like every quarterback, but I think maybe especially with someone that needs the level of development that he'll need situation does matter a lot. And sure. I mean, we saw Trevor Lawrence who, you know, is the greatest quarterback prospect since pick a guy. And he was awful because yeah. the rookie because he was in an awful situation. Right. So I'm, I'm happy. I, I would love to have seen him be a Seahawk. He was my number one guy for sure. But uh, no, no, I'm not mourning it. The reason I put him on the list and honestly, I could put him a lot higher is I think we have proof of concept with a guy like Anthony Richardson over the last five years with guys like Lamar Jackson and Justin Fields and Jalen Hurts, all none of which got the draft capital that Anthony Richardson did. So we've, we've seen those guys elevate themselves onto this list and some of them very high on this list um, coming in with some of the same questions that yeah. Anthony Richardson has. I'll say, I thought uh, Jackson was a, more advanced passer than Richardson coming into the NFL. Totally agree. And I think so totally again, agree. with the timeline, I would have been more comfortable uh, putting him if in If Lamar there. was coming out now, he's a top five pick. And, yes. And even, yeah, that, totally. And even Fields, um, it, that that's a weird one because we didn't know he was so athletic in college, comes into the right. NFL. And now, you know, he's in my top 20, but he still has a lot to prove as a passer. Yep. Um, at this point, he is, uh, you know, an elite uh, rusher, and in most metrics, finishes near the bo- has finished near the bottom of the NFL in passing last year. So obviously, context matters yeah. there a great deal. So yeah. um, I do think, you know, when when guys can run the way Richardson can run, it does give them a floor in the league that's pretty meaningful, though. Yeah, yeah, and that floor, you know, the rushing floor has been kind of a fantasy buzzword for a long time, but I think we're starting to see the NFL actually understand that there's real football application to a quarterback that can just steal first downs and steal touchdowns in the red zone when yards are the hardest to come by. Um, I do think it's something that things are being valued more as, and even though we're doing a two year window on this, the reason that I put Anthony Richardson is I, he could really struggle this first year. I still have him there because I think by the time he has a season of NFL play, you know, on under his feet, I think he, <laughs> I think he could get a barge Hurts his way into this top ten. Is what yeah, hoping, absolutely, yeah. it happens so fast yeah. with a guy like Jalen Hurts. And uh, I, you know, Hurts was more certainly a more productive uh, collegiate passer than uh, Anthony Richardson. But again, context very, very different situations in terms of quarterback friendliness. Yeah. Last last guy I want to touch on real quick because I think he might just stink is Derek Carr. <laughs> I don't think he stinks. You had Carr up there a bit. Uh, yeah, he he's an interesting one because he's a little different from. So there's kind of like a glut of Shanahan quarterbacks. Cousins mm-hmm. is sort of the top end. Tannehill, yep. I got in the mix. Goff. Matt Ryan was there for a long time. Yeah, uh, Jimmy G, obviously, who didn't make my list, but um, 
So it's interesting. That's sort of like the middle class of the NFL right now. Like I, I think most rankings, when you look in kind of like when you're like 14 through 22, a lot of those guys are swimming there where, they, where you know yeah. that they can operate that offense and that offense can look really, I mean, shit, look at Detroit right now, which is not, it's, um, you know, a, a very different offense from what Goff ran with the Rams, but it's similar in so far as it's very play action heavy it's very uh, dominant offensive line. He's very well protected. The scheme really gets guys open, et cetera, et cetera. Carr's a little bit different from the rest of them, which is kind of interesting in that um, I think he is uh, has more arm talent when he's willing to push the ball downfield. Mm-hmm. Um, he can make some plays outside of structure when he's willing to, but his play really goes up and down. I think it, we've seen that over the course of, of his career last year being a down that was kind of interesting because um, it just so much of the Raiders offense when it looked gross, it looked just like the coach and the, and car were on totally different pages. Nothing really made sense. Sometimes they'd run kind of Patriot style type stuff and sometimes they wouldn't. Um, I think though he has shown enough, in terms of like his highs, and we've seen a lot of them in Las Vegas and Oakland more so, um, have him as like a nine to 13 range quarterback when he is having his highs. So yep. it really depends on the situation, but I've seen him get there on his own. Could the same be said about Carson Wentz? Um, his lows are way lower to me. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Because yeah. I think, I, you know, the, the quarterback that, that Carr gets slumped in with all the time is Kirk Cousins. And mm. and to me, I, I just think Cousins is so, so much better than, than Derek Carr is. But, you know, Carr is in a situation where, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's tough probably to get along with Josh McDaniels. Tom Brady didn't get along with Josh McDaniels. And, and so, you know, I'm excited to see what he can do in New Orleans. He's got some weapons there, especially if Michael Thomas is healthy. Um, but yeah, he's he's the guy that could inch up my list, but I could also potentially see the bottom falling out. Yeah. Where do you think David Carr has him on his list? <laughs> is there a rank higher than one? <laughs> <laughs> um, Kirk is really fascinating too because last year was kind of an unusual season for him. Like typically in Minnesota, he's been like a statistically great quarterback who everybody knows isn't as good as the numbers. But last mm-hmm. year, I would argue that sort of flipped on its head where his stats were not very good, but I thought he showed me more in terms of um, making plays on his own under pressure, even outside of structure, throwing the ball downfield, trusting his receivers. So uh Part of the reason I'm high on him, I'm high on the Vikings offense next year because of the weapons that they added. Oh, man. But uh, yeah, but I, I but I think he's like a little bit better than your average Shanahan quarterback, um, which is why he's probably going to terrorize us when he lands in San Francisco inevitably in free agency. <laughs> no, it's it's happening. It's a freaking inevitability. <laughs> yeah, totally. Before we get back to Gino, I want to take a quick diversion for a moment. Around where do you both see Drew Locke slotting in on a similar list, ranking backup quarterbacks oh league wide? Huh. Just like an approximation. Uh, I'm trying to think of who the good backups are. We're, okay, let's do our division. <laughs> okay. So the Niners, who the, I don't even know who the backup quarterback is. Darnold, <laughs> yeah. Lance, whatever. They're probably all better than than Locke. Than Locke. I know. I tweeted a very self-hating tweet when they when the Niners signed Sam Darnold. Can't wait for him to beat us on Thanksgiving. <laughs> Book don't, it. Don't put, that, Book don't it. put that out there. Uh, okay, so the Rams, uh, it's Stetson Bennett now, right? Which is hilarious. Uh-huh. Okay, I'll, I'll give Locke better than Bennett. We'll do that. All right. Maybe. Who knows? Um, and then the Cardinals, I guess it's, uh, what's his face? Colt McCoy. Colt McCoy, yeah. I, I mean, we've lost to so many of these random Cardinals backups over the years. I don't even know. I might take McCoy. I might take, yeah. <laughs> I, I was actually pretty annoyed that they signed Locked, honestly. I mean, it's such a minor thing, whatever. If we're there anyways, it's kind of over. But I I prefer, I, I would have preferred for them to try something else at the backup. They paid him a fair amount too. Yeah, I think I think got like four million dollars. Uh, so so let me ask you this because this is what I look for in a backup quarterback. I I'm not gonna pretend that you need 
to expect a Nick Foles type of step in for a Carson Wentz MVP season and lead your team to the Super Bowl championship. Like that, that's a yeah. total one off thing. So when I look at backup quarterbacks, I don't, I'm looking at it through the lens of if my starter goes down for a month, can this guy go two and two? If he's out for six weeks, yeah. can he go three and three? Given how the Seahawks are built, offense they run, obviously it depends on who they're playing during that stretch, but just a random four game stretch in this schedule. Can the team go two and two with Drew Locke there? I don't know, man. I mean, but <laughs> I, I think that's a great way to put it. I also think the Seahawks, what you have to look at is like, how good is the offense? The offense in the Seahawks, uh, the Seahawks offense, it, it, it's not, I wouldn't say it's a Ferrari, but it's a BMW. So like you really just, yeah. you kind of want a pro. You don't really need a high variance guy. Um, mm -hmm. You need like a Shanahan quarterback. You, you just need someone who can come in and, you know, uh, run play action and maybe boot out a little bit and keep the trains running. And I, the problem with Locke is just, he's so inaccurate uh, throwing. He's it. Leroy Jenkins. Yeah. I just don't trust him at all. Yeah. Sorry. No, nope, I'm, I wish I was I'm, more optimistic. I'm, I'm with you. It's, it's just so funny now a year back to look at the Drew Locke versus Geno Smith, the uh, camp battle, right? It, it felt very 50, 50 for a long time there. And I, uh, I thought there were going to, I think they personally think that they thought it was going to be Drew Locke when they did the trade. Everything I've heard suggests to me that that's true. Um, at, I, I mean, I have all these like apoplectic, like, opinions and takes where i was like screw it the season's over because i thought drew lock was gonna be the quarterback i really right. did and which isn't to say i i definitely didn't know gina smith would be as good as he is but i felt pretty confident that i knew who drew lock was as a quarterback uh and i listen we're blessed we're not living <laughs> yeah. in that timeline <laughs> yeah, seems no like a kidding. really nice guy i'm sorry <laughs> it's yeah, it's so funny. It just it reminds me so much about them making the move for Matt Flynn. Yeah. And then Russell Wilson was just kind of the project in waiting. And it was just like, nope, it's it's very obvious, very early, which guy is the guy. Uh, zeroing back in on Gino, when you look at Smith's fit in Seattle, what do you see? And and by that, I mean, you think Pete Carroll, John Schneider are approaching this from a, look, Gino's our guy, no matter what perspective, or given the structure of his contract extension, do you think they're kind of keeping one eye on the market as well? I mean, it's a fabulous contract for the team. So should we start there? Like huge W for them. Compare that to some of the, the Daniel Jones deal. I mean, it's so flexible. Um, and yeah, like I do think you usually, you do have to follow the money a little bit and the money suggests that they did want to keep their options open, which is smart. Um, I think for me, the question isn't like, okay, does this mean that they want to like, that they're willing to move on, you know, at a moment's notice. I don't think that's true. I think the question is kind of like, how much leeway does he have? Uh, right. Like, let's say he regresses a little bit and maybe he's more like the 15th best quarter, 15th best quarterback. Is that something that they would want to move on from next season? How much do they believe in him? If there's some sort of hardship that I don't know, I don't really, I still don't know how serious they were about Anthony Richardson. I've heard really mixed things on that front, frankly. Mm -hmm. um, but I do know that they're, I mean, that they absolutely believe that they can win playoff games with Geno Smith. The way that they've approached team building tells us that beyond just the contract, they think that they can compete with him, that this can be a very strong offense. And, um, I, I think it's the, it, by all accounts, are comfortable letting him throw, push the ball downfield, throw the ball on early downs. Uh, there's, so when you look at the roster moves and the football decisions, they indicate a level of trust in the quarterback um, yeah. that I think is equally important uh, as the contract, for example. And I'm in agreement with them based on what we saw last year. Yeah. So, so let me piggyback off of that ask you this do you think we saw the best that Gino has to offer last year or is there something about his game that leads you to believe he could take even another step forward um I think he can take a, a step forward I mean when you consider the fact that you know he has never like he hadn't had a full season recently and a full off season as the undisputed QB one that's pretty significant I also think his circumstances will be better this season. I suspect, you know, the offensive line should be better because they had young players t typically. Um, you know, they'll play better. The tackles, obviously, although I, I do have some concerns about the interior. 
And then uh, the Seahawks now have one of the two or three best wide receiver trios in football with the addition of Jackson yeah. Smith and Jake Bye. But I wouldn't overlook Will Disley rejoining this team. You know, the Seahawks used a lot of uh, 12 and 13 personnel last year, but as the season went on, they weren't particularly efficient in doing so. I think he is a, an underrated player in terms of his versatility and toughness and what he brings to that offense and and he helps that room too so top to bottom when you look at you know everything around Geno Smith when you consider he's had more time in the system there's no reason why he can't be better this season I do think he got a little bit lucky though with some turnover worthy plays so I think it's more likely than not that that interception number ticks up which you know will cost some panic I'm glad you mentioned it so I didn't have to yeah but yes some luck. Yeah. Uh, I, I so, Also, the running game, I think, is going to be better. You know, just the addition of Zach Charbonnet, who's a, a prospect I really liked, and then hopefully Walker being healthy. Yeah, yeah. So uh, to kind of put a, a point on this part of the discussion, we've got Gino at number 10. He has another season that approximates last year. Does he and, – and let's say for the sake of this discussion that Rodgers decides to come back for another year, does he move – up above any of the guys that we both have right above him, Aaron Rodgers, Dak Prescott, Trevor Lawrence. Is there any chance of him pushing up? Because the rubber band is stretched pretty high upwards with Geno already. Yeah. And and it's harder now, right? It's much easier to go from the 20th best quarterback to the 15th best quarterback to the 10th. But going 10 to 5 is really, really difficult. there room for Geno to move up this list? I, th- I think someone in the top seven would have to... Well, I guess you could leave Lawrence out of it. Top six would have to really decline for him to make that kind of move. Lawrence, I think, uh, you know, we saw amazing play from the second half of the season, but it's a bit of a small sample size there. But some of that comes from, you know, who we know he is as a player and what he's capable of. Um, I do think there's a world in which um, he's as uh, he starts kind of lining up more with Dak Prescott. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, he's viewed that way, especially if he plays better than he did last season. Um, but yeah, it's, it's pretty hard. It's pretty rarefied air near the top. Yeah, for sure. And then on the flip side of all of this, how likely is it in your mind that we do see significant regression now that there's a full season of tape out on him in this offense? I don't think it'll be significant personally. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, like I said, I suspect there'll be more interceptions, but I think that the overall offensive improvement in terms of the skill players and the uh, comfort in the system and the time will counter some of that. Hopefully the running game gets back on track as well. Um, You know, it would be more likely if uh, he wasn't in such a great situation, but Mm -hmm. you could drop a lot of quarterbacks into the Seahawks offense and they would play pretty damn well right now because of how stacked it is so and i I also like shane waldron as a play caller so um i think all of those things it's kind of like you know i was just talking about jared goff who is a quarterback who kind of took a i mean he was ranked like 24th 22nd 23rd in qbr and last year he jumps to fifth right and Mm -hmm. i'm not fooled (laughs) Like, I don't believe Jared Goff is an elite quarterback, but I believe he's a quarterback who's very situation dependent. And I expect the Lions situation to stay good. And which isn't to say I'm comparing Geno to Goff. My point rather is that when we talk about regression, you really have to consider the circumstances. And I have a lot of faith in what Seattle's put around him. Yeah. And we hear the word regression. We we tend to associate it with negative, but. I actually think I I do think there's regression coming with interceptions. Um, he, he had a lot of those dropped last year, but I think that there is room for positive regression in his touchdowns. And I say that yeah, because he actually had a really low completion percentage when targeting the end zone. Yeah. Um, I was I was on uh, KJR this morning talking about DK Metcalf and twist my arm to do that, but. One of the things I pointed out is DK Metcalf had more end zone targets than any other wide receiver in football last year, 24 of them, Hmm. and only six were completed. Wow. So normally you like to see, obviously your your completion percentage when you're targeting the end zone is going to go down. It's a compressed field. There's more defenders around, tighter windows, all that stuff. But you expect that completion percentage to go from that 65, 70 range, maybe down to 50, 55%. He was completing like, 40% 40% of his end zone uh, targets last year. If that even gets to 50, 55%, we're going to see another half dozen touchdowns out of this guy. There are two areas where I expect Seattle to prove. One is red zone efficiency. 
Um, I think Jackson Smith and Jigma is going to be mm -hmm. helpful there as well. He's really good at getting open quickly underneath. Um, so I really like him as kind of almost like a you know, Edelman type weapon. Mm -hmm. uh, He's going to bring that Doug Baldwin God, goal we've, line we've been quick missing separation. That, you know, those yeah. releases. Uh, and the other thing is yards after the catch with Seattle ranked near the bottom of the NFL. And I think, again, like that's not really DK Metcalf's game. So I think that's another one where having three very good wide receivers on the field uh, is going to help them a lot in terms of the spacing it creates and then the opportunities after the catch. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I, I really do believe that JSN could be the key that unlocks this offense from being good to very good to potentially top five, top six. I think you've got Seattle, you said, projected at top six right now. I'm strangely comfortable with that. I, I saw enough <laughs> last year to think they could they can do that. And if the defense can get off the field this year, mm. uh, that could mean some really good things for this team. Yeah, the defense I'm a little less optimistic about than the offense. I yeah. mean, we'll see, yeah. you know. But but if the offense is as good as we hope, you know, they don't they just need to be average. Yeah, we're we're going to have some shows talking about that, but uh, you know, as, as far as the the quarterback play in the offense goes, I, I think the arrow is pointed <laughs> up and and maybe pretty steeply. Couple last questions for let you get out of here. One, just if you've got any thoughts on the quarterback class that's supposed to be coming in next year, I know every year the yeah. next year is the class, but this one seems like <laughs> we could see it's six or seven one. guys it with, is with some first round potential. I know. And I, like and I, teams are going to have to make these, these Derek Carr teams, these Jared Goff teams, they're going to have some decisions to make. And this is going to be a problem for Seattle because of Arizona being as bad as they are. And then we'll see what happens with the Rams and, yeah, so one of these guys could terrorize us for a pretty long time. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I've, I've spent a, a lot of time, like everybody's watching Caleb Williams and Drake May. I think they're both excellent. Um, honestly, I have to think this through a little bit, but I probably would have had both at one and two in this year's class, and I like this year's class a lot. Yeah, um, yeah. Very different quarterbacks, but both very modern, I think. Um, you know, <laughs> I mean, May, you're going to, you know, he'll be characterized as the pocket passer, but that dude runs a lot. And uh, Caleb is just lightning. Uh, you, you've seen him play. But I'm really interested in the guys beyond them. Um, of course, our Michael Penix in Washington is going to be a really interesting and probably polarizing prospect because of his age and injury history. But he's a really special. He's got some Hendon Hooker to yeah. his profile. I, I, I think he's better than Hooker. I'll start there. Um, I, I do too. Yeah. I do too. And I think he's going to be a really interesting eval. And I'll be very curious to see if there's any regression from him this year. That's a totally separate regression question. Uh -huh, but that offense is just crazy fun to watch. Bo Nix, I think, is a guy who is suddenly yeah, like totally. looks like he actually took a legitimate leap. Um, McDaniel's the LSU kid is just such an athlete. So, uh, yeah, it's going to be really fascinating. I think we could be looking at another year where you know at least three, four guys go in the first round. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you. I, I think we're going to see some really big shakeup to the quarterback landscape mm -hmm. after this year. I, I think there is just a huge wave of guys that teams are going to use real draft capital on. Yeah. And some of these incumbents that have been hanging out, you know, your, G your Jimmy G style guys, even if they've just signed contracts, I don't think they're going to be safe. <laughs> Get out of here. Yeah. Well, I, uh, fortunately for Gino, he, I could see Seattle drafting someone too. Maybe not in the first, not, they're yeah. not, it's obviously not going to be Mayor Williams, but some of the other guys I mentioned will be in striking distance. I know I could too. All right. Last question before we get you out of here. If you had to make a $10,000 bet right now <laughs> on whether Seattle has a better season this year than they did last year, I'm talking about going further in the playoffs, ah. winning more games, or if they're going to have a worse season or end up essentially the same, win nine games, lose in the first round, which side are you laying the money on? I think it'll be better. I think they'll win more than nine games. Again, the, the teams I just mentioned in the NFC West help. It's about, uh, yeah. and, um, the NFC is wide open this year after those top two teams. Yeah, I agree. I so I, I I like Seattle to win. I think I put them at ten or eleven. I can't remember. I, I broke down the schedule in NFL Live the other day, but more than nine. And then I do think they can win. I think you know San Francisco is always kind of a nightmare draw for us because for a litany of reasons. Um, but uh, so yeah, I think it, it, 
more likely than not, they would play another a different team. So <laughs> that would end well. Yeah, I, I I think so too. That's that's right where I'm at. You know, I'm I'm looking at their again. It's June, but I'm looking at who I think would be their most likely first round opponents, and it's probably teams like the Vikings or the Lions. Um, and I I'm just taking Seattle over those teams. You know, Dallas could be tough, but I think as long as they avoid the Eagles and the 49ers in the first round, no reason to think they're not going to win that first game at least gonna be a fun year i'm excited yeah me too okay as fun as this has been and i know how long we could talk about gino and the qbs this is a great place to stop for the day mina thank you again for taking the time to come in and wrap with us thank you so much and seahawks fans if you're listening and you want to hear me say the offense is six in the nfl check out the latest episode of my podcast me i'm Jeff. yeah for sure it's a regular listen for me it's in the rotation and before we get out of here, where else can the listeners find you? Oh, I'm on NFL Live uh, three days a week during the off season. Otherwise, around the horn. Uh, yeah, so you can just tune in at 1 p.m. Pacific. <laughs> All right. That's going to do it for today, folks. As always, you can find Mike and I on social media as well. I am on Twitter at, at Jackson Bevins. That's J-A-C-S-O-N. Mike is on Twitter at, at Mike Barwin. And the show itself is at Cigar Thoughts. You can also find us on Instagram at Cigar Thoughts NFL, on TikTok at, at Cigar Thoughts, on YouTube at, at Cigar Thoughts, and on Facebook at Cigar Thoughts Football Show. Of course, you can listen to this show and read every article, fieldgoals.com slash Cigar Thoughts. And if you're listening on Spotify or Apple Podcasts and you like the show, drop us a five-star rating, leave us a quick review. Finally, be sure to check out CigarThoughtsNFL.com to get your exclusive Cigar Thoughts cigars, or hit me up on Twitter, I'll shoot you the deets. And when you buy those cigars, let us know on Twitter or Instagram with a pic. Tell us what you think. Thank you to all of y'all listening for your continued support of this show. We know you've only got so much time in your life for podcasts. It's an honor to be a part of that for y'all. Please know that by sharing this show on social media and with your friends, you give us the juice to keep making it happen. We'll be back soon, but in the meantime, onwards and upwards, my friends. Mm-hmm.